Good evening and welcome to our midweek moment. Uh, join us as we sing together, count your many blessings and seek ye first. Father, we thank you. We thank you that we can come and t can, can just enter your presence and, t and know you. We can reflect on the blessings that you've poured out on us and rest in the kindness and the love and the provision that you offer. God, we do want to seek you first. We don't want anything to get in our way. And so I pray, Father, that you would remove all the distractions from our minds. Father, allow us just to be refreshed by you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening, church family. Thank you for joining us for this midweek moment. A couple of things that I wanted to remind you of, um, or announce, rather, for the first time, a few. Uh, first of all, coming up on October the 24th, we have our hymn sing. Uh, we're going to have an, a service here on a Sunday afternoon highlighting some of the hymns that are your favorites. And for us to be able to do that, we need to know what your favorites are. And so we have a few cards around here if you want to make your suggestions, but also you can email us uh, and send in your, your hymn suggestions. Um, you can email me, Doug at MayfieldRoad.org, or Lee, uh, Lee at MayfieldRoad.org. Um, send your, your suggestions. We'll look forward to, to having that time together. Also, starting on October the 24th and running through that week is our Music Ministry Silent Auction. And we're now accepting donations for that. 
And so every year our, our silent auction goes to support our music ministry. And so if you have items that you'd like to donate for the auction, uh, we would love to receive those now. Uh, you can call the church office to get information about that, or you can pick up one of the green pieces of paper around the church uh, office here to submit a donation. And then one last thing, our fall festival. We're going to host our fall festival once again this year. It's going to be on Friday, October the 29th from 6 to 8. It's going to be a trunk or treat, and uh, we need your help for that. Uh, we're going to be receiving donations for, uh, for canned drinks or for candy, uh, or if you want to uh, have your vehicle as uh, the, one of the trunks for the trunk or treat, we would love to have you help with that. And so if you'll contact Philip. Uh, to see about how you can be involved with that. But that's coming up, a lot coming up in the next few weeks, and so we hope you'll be a part of it. Well, this past Sunday, we were going through our series on Jesus Said in the Sermon on the Mount, and we looked at the Beatitudes, that passage in, in Matthew 5, the series of blessings that Jesus says there. It's a famous passage, and we looked at it all at once this past Sunday, well, that gives us kind of like the 30,000-foot view. Well, over the next few weeks here on our midweek moment, we're going to zoom in a little closer and look at these statements of blessing one by one so we get a little better picture about what Jesus is saying. There's so much there. We wanted to get kind of the big view just so we have a frame of reference and then be able to dive in a little deeper. And so if you have your Bible close, let me ask you to go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 5. And we said that the Beatitudes, these are not attitudes that we should have. These are not things that we're supposed to be. It's not a practice for us to do. Um, but rather, Jesus is proclaiming blessings to all of the people who follow him. And in the Beatitudes in, in particular, he's highlighting people who are not normally thought of as blessed. And so he's proclaiming to every person who follows him, whoever follows Jesus, they are blessed more than they can possibly imagine. And so he's going down a list of people and he's highlighting blessings for folks who normally were not considered blessed or maybe didn't feel blessed in this, their particular station in life. And so this is what Jesus is saying. He is offering blessing or proclaiming blessing to all who follow him. And the very first thing that he says in Matthew 5, verse 3, is this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This idea, the poor in spirit, the people that Jesus has in mind here, are those who we might think of as spiritually bankrupt or spiritually in poverty. They're people that they have a sense they have nothing to bring to God. You know, when we think about, um, you know, approaching God, sometimes, sometimes we get a little full of ourselves and we think, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to come to God and, and, of course, God loves me and, and I can do great things for God because of, you know, the gifts that he's given to me or the talents that I have or, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, we think of being able to bring something to God sometimes. And, of course, in our when we really think about it, we realize that's a little bit of an arrogant view. That's not actually how it is. God is, needs nothing from us. But we sometimes do kind of have an attitude there, even if we wouldn't say it, that, well, I have something to offer. The interesting thing, when people are in poverty, they're very mindful of their limited resources. And so Jesus is playing off this idea of poverty, and he's saying, you know, when you're in a sense of poverty or a state of poverty, you're very aware of what you don't have to offer. And he's saying, there's some of you who are very aware when it comes to approaching God, you have nothing to offer him. And it may be because of, you know, the baggage in your past, or it may just be the the situation you find yourself in. You may be in physical poverty, and that just highlights how little you have to offer, and it bleeds over into your spiritual life too. This is an important thing for us to maybe consider because 
for most of us, while probably none of us would consider ourselves wealthy, by the world's standards, the vast majority of us live pretty comfortably. And it's not really until you think about someone who is living in extreme poverty in our world that we really understand what it means to be without resources, to be without anything to offer. Several years ago, I was on a mission trip to India, and some of the pastors there were taking me around one afternoon to meet the different members of their church and to pray with them and uh, just to get to know them, just to be kind of an encouragement. They took me to one little shack, and there was a, a widow and her teenage son that lived there. It was um, just a, a dirt floor, and inside they, they just had a, a wood-burning stove. So when it came time for the woman to, to offer me some tea, which was an absolute custom, it was just what good manners require, she offered me tea. I said, look, I'm fine. But she said, no, I have to make you some. So she went back and started a fire to boil the water to make tea. She, this was a family very much in poverty, very limited on the resources. And as I was enjoying the tea a little later, we got to talking, and through the translator, she told me her story. Her husband had died. She had, and her son had become Christians. And because they had chosen to follow Jesus and to leave the faith of their family, their tradition, some of her family members had come and taken possession of the land that was hers, the land that her husband had worked. And so now they were living in this little shack, just barely scraping by. And her prayer request was that God would, would intervene. They were trying to go through a, a local judge to rule in their favor, but if you don't have money to you know, get the attention sometimes, sometimes you don't get paid much attention to. It could drag on for a long, long time. And so her prayer request was that God would make things right, that justice would be done, that this judge would either have pity on her and do what's right, or somehow, some way, God would work things out to restore them so that they could survive. You know, I, as I was hearing that story, of course it was heartbreaking, but it also was in stark contrast to my life, because I'm sitting here thinking, you know, I'm not wealthy by, you know, by our normal means of measuring it, but I have somebody I could call, or I have some resources I could le leverage. There's always something that I could do. If I were in that spot, I would not be helpless. There'd be something, you know, something I could try to use to, to get ahead, to to deal with that myself. But she had nothing to offer. She had nothing to leverage. She was just in a place of poor and being unable to do anything about it. And I think, as I've thought about this verse, being poor in spirit, there's a sense of helplessness that she experienced that may make her a little bit more aware of how fully dependent on God she is. And the truth is, we are just as fully dependent on God. We just may not see it. Because I have food in my cupboard. Or I have someone I can call if I'm done wrong. And so, there's a sense of all of us have nothing to offer God. But some among us are just a little bit more sensitive to that. Some are just a little bit more aware of how dependent they are on God for everything, on how dependent they are on God for the next breath, for the next meal, for a place to sleep at night. That story, that experience... You know, getting to know her, that, that I think is 
who we should have in mind that Jesus is proclaiming blessing to, to that widow and her teenage son who are just waiting for things to be done, have nothing to offer God. Jesus is saying, for you, you are blessed and the kingdom of heaven belongs to you. That's what he's saying here. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That idea is that already not yet kingdom that Jesus comes to offer, the the kingdom where God sets everything right. We know, as we've talked about many times, Jesus came to launch this revolution where he came to set the world right, to establish God's kingdom on earth where everyone who puts their trust in Christ is made right, where all the world is under God's rule once again. And Jesus established that by his death and resurrection And he went to be seated on the throne of heaven at the right hand of God. And so God's kingdom is now lived for all who follow him. That kingdom is a reality. But right now, there's still a lot of opposition, right? There's still people who don't submit to God's authority. They don't submit to God's rule. And so God's kingdom rule It's something that we know is going on. We know God is the one true king of the world. But not everything is brought to order yet. And so it's already true. It's just not yet fully seen. That's the kingdom that Jesus is proclaiming to those who have nothing to offer. He's saying, you have a place in God's kingdom. Even right now, even when it, you look around and you don't have anything on your shelves, even you f- are very aware that you don't have anything to offer God, Jesus is saying, if you follow me, you have a place in God's kingdom. You are a full-fledged member of God's kingdom. You have a place of belonging, and you have all the privileges that go with it. One day you'll experience it, one day you'll You know, you'll see it. For right now, even though you don't see it, it's yours. And so Jesus is proclaiming blessing to those who have nothing to offer God. He's saying, because of what I've come to do, because of the redemption that I offer, whoever follows me, It doesn't matter that you have nothing to offer because Jesus came to offer you everything. A place to belong in God's eternal kingdom. Membership that starts now, that grounds your identity now, that gives you a sure hope, a confident hope now. And one day, you experience it fully. That's the first blessing that Jesus proclaims. And the truth is, while it's one that some may understand a little more than others, it may hit home a little more for for some among us than others, the reality is none of us have anything to offer God. And yet He offers us everything. He offers us redemption and life. He offers us a place in his kingdom. That's a blessing that is ours if we follow him. And so let's, let's remind ourselves of that. You know, we all have days where we feel limited and you know, whether it's physic, you know, physically or materially bankrupt. Some days it's just spiritually. We feel like you know, we're, we're just kind of dry or have nothing nothing really to speak for in a spiritual sense. The truth is Jesus offers us blessing in him. And because of what we have as citizens of his kingdom we can rest confident, not in what we offer, but in what he offers. Let's pray together.
Lord Jesus, I thank you so much that you have come to bring blessings, to bless those who don't feel blessed, to bless us when we feel like you never would bless But in your kindness, in your grace, what you've done is you've poured out your love and your kindness and your goodness. You've poured out blessings on us so far beyond our ability to even imagine it. God, we're, we're fully at your mercy. And there's no better place to be. God, I thank you that, as the scripture tells us, we love you because you first loved us. I pray that you'd show us how to rest in the blessing that you offer all who put our trust in you that you offer all who follow Jesus. Show us how to rest in that. Show us how to rejoice and be glad in the blessings you offer. God, continue to guide us as we follow you each day, as we follow you for the rest of this week. Pray that you would use us to be a blessing for you that we would receive the blessings you offer and that we would then reflect that to those around us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.